Peter, verses 1 to 12. And I'm reading from the New International Version. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with greatest care trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing, when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told you, by those who have preached the gospel to you, by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even angels long to look into these things. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. In the next few weeks, uh, we will be reading through the first letter of Peter. And the uh, first Peter of letter will, is written to uh, a group of Christians in what is known as Northern Turkey today, and we'll unfold that um, as uh, we read the story of their lives. Uh, let us pray. Father, once again, thank you, Lord, that we can gather like this, both online and in the sanctuary in person. And we just like to thank you that you have kept us safe through this trial. And as we read as to how Peter addresses the trials of the people in what is known as Northern Turkey today. We pray, Lord, that the message of First Peter uh, will strike re relevant in our hearts, that the Holy Spirit will impress upon us that God is with us no matter whatever happens. And so, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray that you will make an impact in our lives both through the reading of these words today, but also in the next few weeks when we read First Peter together. We ask all this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the people say it, Amen. When I came to Vancouver in 1988, I came on a student visa. Uh, this was because I came to do theological and biblical studies at Regent College on the UBC campus. And then eight years later, in 1996, I was blessed by God to become a permanent resident, or in those days, uh, they would call them landed immigrants. Um, I was not a citizen of Canada yet. I had a Malaysian passport, uh, but was recognized as a permanent resident of Canada. In some ways, I was living in exile from Malaysia. 
mom was alive at that time, um, and both my parents had this longing uh, that I would return to Malaysia one day permanently. Therefore, I kept my Malaysian passport. However, as time went on, I became entrenched in pastoral ministry in East Vancouver. I made my home in East Vancouver. Now, I would visit Malaysia every year, but maintained my place of stay and work in Canada. I was exiled from Malaysia, but living in Canada. In the next few weeks, we will be studying First Peter. Peter, the apostle and disciple of Jesus Christ, writes this letter, and that's why this letter bears his name. Peter writes this letter to God's chosen people, scattered exiles. God's chosen people, scattered exiles throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And this is northern Turkey today. So who are these people to whom Peter writes his first letter? Firstly, they are called God's chosen people, God's elect. This means that they are people who have responded to God's initiative through His Son, Jesus Christ. Um, as the start of this letter says, uh, they have been sanctified by the Holy Spirit and sprinkled with the blood that Jesus spilled on the cross. And so these are the people who have responded positively to the saving initiative of the Heavenly Father. The Heavenly Father, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the persons of the Trinity, are all working together as one holy divine team to bring us salvation. That is the main message of First Peter. So Peter calls the recipients of this letter scattered exiles. So the word the words scattered exiles mean that these people are living away from home. Why? Why are they living away from home? There are two possible scenarios. Firstly, these people are people who have made who, who, who have moved away from their homes wherever they were and have made their new homes in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Britannia. And right now, they are being persecuted for their faith. And because of that, Peter, who is in Rome, writes this first letter to encourage them in their Christian faith. Now, there is also another reason why they might be called scattered exiles. And this is found in verse 3 to 5 of First Peter chapter 1, if I could read it again. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded uh, by God's power until the coming of salvation um, that is ready to be revealed in the last time. The recipients of this letter are of the view that this world is not their home. Home for them is where God is, heaven. And until they reach this true home, they are scattered exiles. God still protects them until they reach this home. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. That is what these scattered exiles believe in. And it is not only the people who receive this letter who are being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ in the first century. Peter acknowledges that Christians all over the world are experiencing persecution. So a major theme in this letter, First Peter, is suffering for the sake of Jesus Christ. And later on in this letter, in 1 Peter chapter 4, Peter refers this as a fiery ordeal that has come to them. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory 
is revealed. First Peter 4, 12 to 13. We live in Canada where we have freedom of faith and religion. However, in many parts of the world, Christians are persecuted for their faith. And here in first century northern Turkey, Christians are also persecuted for their faith. And so Peter writes to encourage them, um, just as Jesus suffered in the hands of religious leaders and the Roman authorities, Peter tells them that they too experience suffering and persecution in the hands of their local authorities. And Peter says that just as gold is refined by fire, their faith is also refined by fire as they go through this persecution and suffering. Recently, we had a time to pause and remember what happened to the World Trade Centers in New York in September, on September 11, 2001. Right after September 11, um, Anne was part of a disaster relief team trying to help first responders as they go through the rubble um, of the disaster looking for signs of life. And as she went through the rubble, suddenly a, appearing in front of her was an image of the cross from the rubble uh, that remained um, of the Twin Towers. And being a person who prayed frequently, uh, and somehow heard God speaking this message to her as she saw the cross in the middle of the rubble. As I was staring at that, I got a sense of peace. I got a very strong message. That message was, you are not alone. I am here. So this is what God says to the recipients of First Peter. You are not alone. I am with you. This is a fiery trial, but we are here for you. We will keep you safe through this fiery trial. We are now in the seventh month of this coronavirus crisis. And I believe that Jesus says the same words to us. You are not alone. I am with you. This is a fiery trial, but we are here for you. We will keep you safe through this fiery trial. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So Peter acknowledges that these Christians are suffering all kinds of trials, and they experience grief in the middle of it. The Roman authorities are persecuting them, and if they are slaves, their masters are tormenting them because of their faith. And people in their families misunderstand them. So the life of these Christians threaten others, and this exposes them to shame and ridicule. How does God assure them that He is with them? Well, have you ever wondered why the church teaches that God exists as a trinity of persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Because here in the first chapter of First Peter, it is very clear that all these three persons of the trinity are doing their part to save the people in northern Turkey. It is as if God is bending over backwards in his Trinitarian existence to save the people who are being persecuted wherever they are. And there are three ideas coming from this first chapter of First Peter. Number one, the Father takes the initiative to save us. This letter starts with the statement that the Heavenly Father chooses to save us. Right before the beginning of time, 
the Heavenly Father looks into the future and has mercy on us, and we are chosen by foreknowledge of God the Father. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So, the Father does this by giving us new birth. He sends His Son, Jesus, to save us. We are unable to save ourselves. We need rebirth. And God, the Father, gives us rebirth, new birth, through Jesus Christ. And we are adopted into His family. Number one, the Father takes the initiative to save us. Number two, the Son rises from the dead and will return to save us. Peter refers to Jesus sprinkling blood on us. This is a referring, reference to the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus for us. Peter tells his readers to hang on to their faith. Hang on until Jesus comes again. When Jesus returns, we will receive the final result of our faith, the total salvation of our souls. And Peter tells them that although they suffer, they suffer for a moment. One day Jesus will return and bring them their full salvation. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Revelation 21, verse 4. Number one, the Father takes initiative to save us. Number two, the Son rises from the dead and will return to save us. And number three, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us and speaks to us. At the beginning of this letter, Peter tells his readers that the Holy Spirit sanctifies us. What does the word sanctify mean? It means the Holy Spirit makes us holy and righteous before God. And this means through the new birth, the Spirit claims us and sets us apart for God. The Spirit applies God's salvation to us. It is the Holy Spirit who imprints the presence of God into our hearts. And how does the Holy Spirit do this, according to Peter? It is a Spirit who guides the prophets of the Old Testament to predict the sufferings of Jesus and the glories that will follow. And it is the Holy Spirit who makes sure that the good news of Jesus' saving grace is imprinted into our hearts through the preaching of the good news. So it is the Holy Spirit who comes into our lives and turns us around and gives us new birth. It is the Holy Spirit who applies the salvation of Jesus to us. So if I can repeat the three reasons how the Trinity works to save us. Number one, the Father takes the initiative to save us. Number two, the Son rises from the dead and we will return to save us. And number three, the Holy Spirit sanctifies and speaks to us. My son, Luke, and I go to the movies often. Uh, now that he is at university, uh, we might not get to do this as often as we used to in the past. Now, recently, uh, Luke and I had the opportunity to go see the recent Christopher Nolan film, Tenet. Now, I'm not going to give away the plot of the movie. However, I just need to let you know that this film is a spy movie about a theoretical scientific algorithm which inverts time. What does this mean? Don't I sound scientific when I make that statement? This allows people to move backwards, to move backwards or forwards in time. In other words, through the magic of the film camera, the characters in the film are able to return in time to correct the mistakes of the past or to go into the future to make the future look better. The now is paused through the camera lens uh, so that we can do something about the past or do something about the future. First Peter chapter 1 tells us that the Trinitarian God can press a pause on space and time. And when the Trinitarian God presses 
the pause on space and time, he enters the world as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Why? To save us. To save us. It is like C.S. Lewis writing a pause into the story as he writes one of the Chronicles of Narnia. It is like C.S. Lewis inserting himself into one of the stories of the Chronicles of Narnia. Can you imagine if C.S. Lewis pauses his writing of the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe, um, and then inserts himself as the character C.S. Lewis into uh, that uh, story? And so he then goes as C.S. Lewis to Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy and says this, don't worry, Aslan is with you. You are not alone. The wicked white witch might be in control, but Aslan will save you. So therefore, First Peter is a letter from Peter in Rome to his fellow Christians in northern Turkey to say that Aslan the lion has inserted himself into the picture of their lives, into the story of their lives. And Aslan the lion is about to save them from this fiery ordeal. Please pause for a moment. Don't be so concerned about the, 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 uh, the past and don't be concerned about the future. Pray about them. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have inserted themselves into our time and space. They have come to save us. You might think that there is no end to this persecution. Hang on. God has already saved you. God is saving you right now, and God will save you totally in the future. When Mr. Beaver tells them about Aslan, the children think that he is a man. Mr. Beaver corrects them and says, Aslan is a lion. Then the children ask if they can be safe with a lion. Aslan is a lion. The lion, the great lion, says Mr. Beaver. Oh, says Susan. I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, says Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Cause he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. So as we go through this crisis right now, remember, God is with us. We might not feel safe, but God will save us. God has inserted himself into our time and space, and God will bring us out of this trial. God is good. God is the king. Shall we pray? So, Father, as we glance into our lives right now, and as we pause here in the sanctuary or at home, uh, we have struggles of feeling whether we are safe or not. But we'd like to thank you that you are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who have broken into human space and time. And the main reason why you do this is because you come to save us. And so right now, we'd like to thank you for saving us, and we pray that as we go through this crisis, you will continue to remind us that you are with us and that you have saved us, you are saving us, and you will save us totally. All this we ask in Jesus' name. And the people said, Amen. So we are going to have a time.